Hi, I am Katie Schmidt, a geologist with the Pennsylvania Geological Survey. I'm going to narrate for you a geology field trip to Laurel Caverns, going deep into Pennsylvania's deepest mapped cave. Ryan Maurer with the Fayette County Cave Survey did all of the videography and most of the photography in this presentation. First, I'm going to talk about the location of Laurel Caverns. Then I'm going to talk about the lithology and depositional environment of the bedrock that the cave formed in. Then I'm going to talk about the structure of Chestnut Ridge and a climb. Then I'm going to talk about the speleogenesis, how the cave formed. Then we're going to go on a brief tour of the cave. And then, we, then I'm going to go over conclusions. Laurel Caverns is in southwestern Pennsylvania, down here in Fayette County. Laurel Caverns formed in the Chestnut Ridge Anticline of Fayette County. This is a geologic map done by Jim Shawless and Tom McElroy in 1988. This map, you can see the structure contours on top of the Bragoon Sandstone. The Bragoon Sandstone directly underlies the carbonates of the Ma Chunk Formation. Laurel, Laurel Caverns formed in the carbonates of the Ma Chunk Formation. Here we are zooming in on Laurel Caverns in this regional map. Note the change in dip of the Bragoon Sandstone right at the entrance of Laurel Caverns. Here is an aerial photograph of the Chestnut Ridge. The yellow star marks the location of Laurel Caverns and in the foreground you can see a quarry in the Wimps Gap limestone. Now I am going to go over the depositional environment and lithology of the lower Ma Chunk carbonates and the Bragoon sandstone. I'm going to start with the Bragoon sandstone because that was deposited first. Bragoon sandstone is predominantly a medium to coarse grain, medium to light to very light gray sandstone. It was deposited in the early middle Mississippian time in an alluvial deltaic sand plain. Then in the middle to late Mississippian, the Bragoon sandstone was uplifted in northwestern Pennsylvania which led to tilting and erosion of this sandstone to the north. In Laurel Caverns, iron concretions mark the boundary between the Loyal Hanna Limestone and the Bragoon Sandstone. Cavern development does not occur beneath this layer that contains the iron concretions. The Loyal Hanna Limestone was deposited on top of this disconformity in a shallow marine complex. This was a site of mixed transgressive and quartz sand. This Depositional environment included at a shallow marine sea to the southwest in which the Greenbrier limestone was deposited in West Virginia and southwestern Pennsylvania. The sandy Loyal Hanna limestone was deposited in the Aeolian sand sheet and dune fields up here. The source of the sands in these fields was the eroding Bragoon sandstone in the northern highlands. Cross-bedding angles of up to 30 degrees have been observed in Laurel Caverns. In the state of Pennsylvania, the composition of the Little Hanna limestone averages about 50% detrital quartz. Measurements from quarries around Fayette County show compositions ranging from 21% silica and 75% calcium carbonate to 54% silica and 39% calcium carbonate. A transgressive sea event deposited the more pure Deer Valley limestone on top of the Little Hanna limestone. In Laurel Caverns, the Deer Valley limestone lies directly on top of the Little Hanna limestone. Above the Deer Valley is a calcite sandstone layer that is about four feet thick. This sandstone is buff and medium grained. These various clastics and the moth chunk Sandstones and shales above the carbonates you've eroded from mountains to the east and southeast of this location, so, so over from this direction. Here we are in the dining room in Laurel Caverns. In this room, you can see the sandstones of the Malchon Formation exposed, a thin shale layer. This ledge here is the Deer Valley limestone, and then the cavern back here is in the Loyal Hanna limestone. Now let's talk about the structure in the Chestnut Ridge Anticline. Laurel Caverns formed in the summit dome of the Chestnut Ridge. In the Chestnut Ridge, extensive cave development occurred in both the summit and the Griffin domes. Uplift of these domes led to erosion, which lessened the confining stresses on joints in the bedrock. 
joints in the sandy limestone were then further widened by dissolution with the carbonate cement. And now let's go deeper into the chestnut ridge anticline. This is a model modified from Jacobian and Keynes, 1974. This paper was about the broad top synclinarium east of Laurel, but I still think these structures apply to the chestnut ridge. In their model, Jacobian and Keynes took into account the different mechanical strengths and behaviors of the strata. They broke the subsurface up into several mechanical units. In the late Precambrian to early Cambrian, the Precambrian basement was faulted during the extensional event that created the Proto-Atlantic Ocean. Here's the fault. After this, the bedrock underwent multiple compressional episodes related to mountain building in the east. Laurel caverns formed in the Mississippian strata above DO, and these strata include sandstone, shales, and carbonates. These strata are not shown in this model, but according to Jacobian and Keynes, they are deformed into tightly folded and faulted structures. This model takes into account the various extensional and compressional events that the strata have been subjected to. And again, look how complicated the faults get in these DO strata, and it gets even more complicated above that. We see some of this in Laurel Caverns. Now let's get on to speleogenesis, how the cave actually formed. I like this quote by Dr. Grabovsek. The dynamics of speleogenesis and the resulting geometry of the conduit network strongly depend on the local hydrology, lithology, structure, geochemical settings, and topography. In researching low caverns, I had to study some different methods of cave formation because this is a very silica-rich you know, limestone formation. And one term I found was phantomization, where the calcite cement dissolves, but then there's nothing mechanical to remove the remaining sand grains. So you just get sand that looks like the original rock, maintaining all the bedding planes and all, but it's, there's nothing holding it together. It's very easy to just dig out, as opposed to more solid rock. And here's a chart explaining some of these different methods of crustification. When I was researching Laurel Caverns, I had read about how um, caves formed in South America and the quartz sandstones down there. And the process those caves formed were aronization, in which the quartz overgrowth or quartz cement was dissolved. But aronization describes a process of quartz dissolution. And then going into multi-component rocks, such as granites, arcosas, or carbonate cemented sandstones, you get to use the term of phantomization, in which the you can have dissolution of clays, feldspars, or carbonate cements, which leads to an increase in porosity and a less soluble fraction remains, such as the sand grains remaining in that passage I just showed you in Laurel Caverns. And then as you get into more carbonate-rich rocks, you get a process known as ghost rock karstification. In ghost rock karstification, you get carbonate cement dissolution, but you still have a less soluble fraction remaining. This less soluble fraction can include spiritic crystals, fossils, quartz, or clays. And here's the model created by Rain Saro and Deboy et al., where You've got this bedrock and discontinuities, such as joints in the bedrock, which allow water to get into the rock and dissolve the cement. And then later on, erosion allows the water to flow out of the bedrock and rinse out these remaining sand grains or clays. Now let's go to Laurel Caverns. In this brief tour, we'll look at some sections of the cave that we will not be able to visit when the field conference travels to Laurel Caverns next year. Here's an old map of Laurel Caverns done by Vic Schmidt in 1974. This map shows the outcrop of the Little Hannah limestone on the ridge. So you can see where the cave falls in the topography and where the bedrock outcrops. Here's an updated map done by Ryan Maurer. In this map, Ryan divides the cave up into four sections. The Maze Cave, Middle Cave, the Flue, and the Lower Cave. 
The maze cave near the visitor center is a network of maze passages. The middle cave is mostly long, straight passages going down dip. The flue is in a heavily faulted section of the cave. And below the flue is the lower cave. Note how different these passages look in these different sections in this map view. Here is a profile map of the cave constructed by Ryan Maurer. Ryan and Hope Brooks made many strike and dip measurements in their old caverns. In the cave, they found an apparent hinge line where the dip changes from 10.6 degrees to 15.7 degrees. The maze section of the cave all formed left of the hinge line where the dip is lower. Middle cave descends from this hinge line to the upper and lower, or to the upper and Solomon squeeze faults. The flue lies between the upper fault and the lower fault. Below the lower fault is lower cave. And here are all these faults shown in the map view of the cave. The upper and lower faults both trend about north 30 degrees east. Solomon's squeeze fault trends about north 7 degrees east, while this hinge line trends about north 40 degrees east. Now here we're zooming in on the maze section of the cave. That's where we're going to start our tour. Here's a good example of some cross bedding in the Royal Cavern. You can see the bedding going at these two angles. The bedding I measured there was about 30 degrees. And here's me measuring cross bedding on the opposite side of the passage from that previous cross bedding. This cross bedding I measured to meet at an angle of about 20 degrees. And here's another picture of a typical passage in the upper cave. And now going from the maze cave to the middle cave. Next video will show the Grand Canyon of Laurel Caverns. Here we are in the Grand Canyon passage of Laurel Caverns. The ceiling of this passage is the Deer Valley limestone. Here you can see the very obvious joint through the center of this passage in the Deer Valley limestone. And the walls of this passage are the Loyal Hannah limestone. The importance of jointing in the formation of this cave was noted as early as 1816 in an article by John Paxton. And then going from the Grand Canyon down into the room known as the Dining Room. So over here is where we looked at the stratigraphy exposed within the cave. And down there, you can see Aaron starting to walk down to the flue. And over here, we can see the upper fault exposed in the cave. Walk all the way over to it here. Yes, here's the upper fault in the cave. And here's a slightly better picture of that upper fault in the cave. And here's a picture of some slick insides along that upper fault in the room known as the stomach. Those slick insides in the stomach, they were in this room. But we'll be going back to the dining room and down through this maze that's called the flue. After you come out of the flue, you'll come into this room known as the ballroom.
and remember the ballroom has the lower fault. Here's a brief video of the lower fault. And here's a closer up of that lower fault where you can see these deformational features alongside the fault. And here is some drag folding associated with the lower fault in the lower cave. The rainbow canopy in the lower cave exp exposes different red, blue, and tan calcitic siltstone shales and sandstones of the Machunk clastics above the carbonate. Remember, these clastics were sourced from the mountains to the east. And crossbedding is not just in the upper cave. Here's some crossbedding in the lower cave. And going down through the lower cave, eventually comes with this low passage down here, which is sometimes wet. Here's a couple pictures of this lower passage going down towards the spring. So in conclusion, Laurel Caverns is a good example of how multiple factors can affect cavern development. Again, here's the quote from Dr. Gravzek. The dynamics of speleogenesis and the resulting geometry of the conduit network strongly depend on the local hydrology, mythology, structure, geochemical settings, and topography. In this study, we looked at the lithology with this highly siliceous limestone and the structure, complicated structure in the Chestnut Ridge Anacline. So I took this model from Ray and Saro and tilted it about 14 degrees to represent the dip of the bedrock in the anticline. And then I added two faults dipping 30 degrees. I did not adjust the joint orientation of this model, but it gives you an idea of some of the complexity of the phantomization process in Laurel Caverns. And here's a list of references I used in this talk. And I want to thank a bunch of people for helping with this presentation. I want to thank Dave Kale, the owner of Laurel Caverns, for allowing us access to the cave to make this presentation. Laurel Caverns is currently closed to visitors due to COVID-19. And I want to thank Ryan Maurer for all his hard work with videography and photography and for sharing his work in the cave with me. I want to thank Hope, Hope Brooks for help with the photography and videography and for sharing her work in the cave. I want to thank Katie Bender for helping with a bunch of the photography, and I want to thank Aaron Schmidt for helping with videography. Of these photos, Dave Kale's photos from his profile on the WVU website, and Aaron's photo was done by Bill Walden. The other three photos were done by Ryan Maurer. If you have any questions from this virtual field trip, the Field Conference of Pennsylvania Geologists will be hosting a live Zoom session on November 20th. Please register for this session using this website. Or if you can't make the session or it's past November 20th when you watch us, please email me at kschmidt at pa.gov. And this photo was done by my coworker Robin Anthony while we were still working in the office. Thank you very much.